we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's just a few minutes after nine. So uh, first of all, I am Linda Topping Streitfeld. I'm the Director of Programs for the National Press Foundation. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We're based here in Washington, D.C. And if you're not familiar with us, our mission is to help journalists understand complicated issues, especially issues like the ones we're talking about today. Um, there is a list of upcoming NPF programs in your folder, so feel free to take a look at that and think about what else you might want to attend. And I'll mention specifically that in this series of programs, uh, we have upcoming in December a focus on housing finance and in January a focus on the Federal Reserve. And so I encourage you to take a look at those. From time to time, the National Press Foundation partners with other worthy uh, institutions. And we're very happy today to be partnering with the Milken Institute Center for Financial Markets, which has funded this program and also provided guidance and topical expertise uh, and our moderator today. You have a handout from them as well. There's a flyer on the table. And uh, you'll see them on your slides. Um, Julianne Brands is here from Milton. She's in the back of the room. She is a point person for them, and as journalists, if you need information from Milton, Julianne is somebody that you'll want to talk to, and I'm guessing you have cards that you can I do, yes. give to folks as well. Yeah, please so, everybody give your card to Julianne. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, also in your folder are bios for each of our speakers today, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to hit the highlights for each one, but I really hope that everybody appreciates and takes advantage of the very deep bench of expertise that we have here at the, at the head of the table. I'm going to start in the middle with Mike DeBonis. He is a reporter covering local politics and government for the Washington Post. Uh, he's been doing this for about a decade, I think, including six years at the Washington City Paper. And he writes a blog, which I highly recommend, the District of DeBonis. <laughs> uh, George Friedlander is Managing Director and a Chief Municipal Strategist with Citigroup Investment Research and Analysis. He's been ranked among the top three municipal strategists nearly every year for 18 years by Institutional Investor and several other important surveys. He's won awards from SIFMA, that's the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. In 2011, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from Smith's Research and Gradings. And on my left is Manju Ganeriwala. She is the state treasurer for the Commonwealth of Virginia. She oversees investment of more than $9 billion in public funds, also the issuance of bonds, management of $15 billion in debt, among other things. She has worked with governors of both parties and recently was elected president of the National Association of State Treasurers. Thank you so much for being here. And finally, our moderator today is Stacy Warden. She's executive director of the Center for Financial Markets at the Milken Institute. Previously, she spent six years with J.P. Morgan in London, two years in New York as part of the Sovereign Debt Restructuring Deal team. She's been a director at NASDAQ. She's worked in international economic development at the U.S. Treasury, the Center for Global Development, and elsewhere. We're very happy to be able to share your expertise today. So we have a lot to cover. Stacy's going to make sure that we have time for questions at the end, but I also want to encourage you to ask questions throughout. These are complicated topics, so if you don't get something or we use some jargon that's unfamiliar to you, please just raise your hand and we'll be happy to manage it. Stacy. Okay. Let's go. Thanks very much for coming in. And, and likewise, we're very uh, pleased to be able to partner with the National Press Foundation. At the Milken Institute, we are kind of violently nonpartisan uh, institute. And our my mission in this town in particular is to kind of help try to raise the quality of debate around financial markets issues. And we think that financial markets education is an extremely important part of our mission. And so we've got programs on the Hill for Hill staffers. We do retreats for members of Congress. And we have, we're hoping to roll out and extend this program uh, with the National Press Foundation for uh, just to be able to go deeper into the mechanics of finance around topical issues today. And the main expertise that I'm going to bring today uh, to this panel is my ability to keep time and, and keep everybody on, on track. So I just want to lay out at a high level how we'll kind of approach the storyline of this. So Manju will start and she'll just give from an issuer perspective what a state treasurer thinks about and some of the issues around the pension liabilities and other, li and other funding uh, um, issues that state tre treasurers face. Then George will talk at a high level about the market, how the market works, 
what are the main components, who are the main players, flow of funds, how uh, munis are trading, et cetera. Then we'll turn back to Manju, who will talk about some of the policy issues coming up and how that will affect the market from her point of view. And then back to George, who will talk about the same thing, policy issues and how he thinks that they will uh, affect markets, and then also talk a bit about uh, Puerto Rico and a bit about Detroit, as those are they're quite topical now. And then Mike, who's been covering this, um, the um, municipal sector for a very long time, will just talk about how he covers, how to get information, how to, what kind of questions to ask uh, to kind of get under the covers of some of these issues. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Manju. All right. So I, I will just kind of give you a high level 101 on bonds and what does a state treasurer think about, you know, when they think of bonds and issuing bonds. So first of all, when you talk about municipal bonds, who are the issuers in the municipal market? Uh, obviously, it's state governments, it's local governments, but in addition to just governmental entities, um, there are many authorities that state and local governments form, regional authorities, political subdivisions. Um, those can issue municipal bonds. Also, charitable organizations like hospitals, um, and other economic development organizations can issue municipal bonds, and I will talk about how they have the authority to issue municipal tax-exempt bonds. So when you talk about municipal bonds, you know, it automatically implies they are tax-exempt because municipal bonds currently are tax-exempt. Now, there are different types of debts a municipal issuer can issue. Um, the highest quality of debt that a municipal issuer, a state government or a local government issues are referred to as GO bonds, the general obligation bonds. They are your most pristine, um, you know, cream of the crop type of um, debt rated uh, bonds. What does a general obligation bond mean to an investor? Uh, well, in a general obligation bond, the issuer is putting the full faith and credit of that issuer. But if it's a state, it's full faith and credit of Virginia. Now, Virginia has a AAA rating from all three um, major rating agencies. And when we talk about AAA rating, that rating is assigned to the general obligation bond. Um, that is the most highly rated. So if Virginia issues different types of bonds, which I'll talk about later, those are not necessarily AAA rated. So when you hear like state like um, Maryland or um, Georgia that have AAA rated, it's AAA rating is assigned to your highest quality bond, which is your general obligation bond. Um, general obligation bond implies that you know the government, uh, the entity issuer is committing to make payment for that bond, um, principal and interest, from whatever sources that is available to the issuer. And in most um, municipal issue, for most municipal issuers, you know, we have taxing powers, states have taxing powers, and if revenue is not available, it's implied that, you know, taxes would be increased to make payment on those bonds. Um, the next category of debt that municipal um, issuers issue is referred to as appropriation supported debt. Now, Virginia issues a lot of appropriation-supported debt also. In appropriation-supported debt, it's secured by revenues that are appropriated by the General Assembly. So appropriation-supported debt doesn't necessarily have the full faith and credit of the Commonwealth behind it. And that's true for any issuer, whether it's a municipal or any other state. Many states issue appropriation-supported debt. It says that the bonds will be paid or investors will receive payment as long as the General Assembly appropriates revenue, appropriates, you know, revenue. However, when you have, when you receive a AAA rating, the investor can be pretty, you know, feel pretty secure that this state is not going to not pay me just because its General Assembly fails to appropriate money. I mean, that just doesn't happen. But that kind of differentiates for you the difference between general obligation bond and appropriation supported debt. So appropriation supported debt in Virginia has a double A plus rating. And it's for that reason, because it doesn't have the full faith and credit behind it. There's another category of debt that states issue and that's called moral obligation debt. Now in moral obligation debt, it's you're morally liable to pay but you're not legally liable to make payment on that debt. So it's again a notch below appropriation back debt. Um, so states may use moral, obli moral obligation 
debt to enhance maybe certain credit ratings. For example, and again, I'll just kind of use examples from my state because I'm just so much more familiar with that. In Virginia, we assist local governments to do, you know, do conduit financing for local governments for financing their infrastructure. And it's done through an entity called Virginia Resources Authority. So these are infrastructure financing for their water and sewer bonds, their you know, government buildings, hospitals, etc. Now, to enhance the credit rating of VRA, the Commonwealth provides a moral obligation uh, to those bonds, saying that we are morally obligated to make payment if the debt reserve, debt service reserve of the VRA goes below certain level. That helps VRA's credit rating go up a notch or you know above than what it would receive on its own. And that helps lower the cost. So it doesn't cost the state government a whole lot because we are banking on the fact that VRA won't you know, fail on its bonds. Uh, but it helps lower the cost for local government. So in Virginia, we've used moral obligation debt for Virginia Housing Development Authority debt, uh, for Virginia Resource Authority debt. But again, the distinction is um, legally the state is not bound to make a payment if a default occurs. Now, revenue bonds can be either general obligation bonds or they can be um, appropriation supported debt. A revenue bond is generally a bond where the payment to the bondholders is going to be made from the project that's being financed. It's often used in higher education arena for like dorms where you know university is building dorms and they know they have they will have guaranteed when fall semester comes along and the students start coming in they can pre predict with certainty as to you know what what they will receive in annual uh, dorm revenue dorm fee revenue and that revenue is pledged to make payments on those bonds um, another example of revenue bond could be transportation debt you know when you're financing um, interstate system or building a toll road, the toll revenue from that tunnel or that bridge will go over to finance um, revenue bonds. Um, leases a certification participation is another category of that. That's not used as much, but it's um, usually financed through lease revenue. Go ahead. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Does that mean then if, if there's higher risk on a moral obligation debt than a general obligation debt that your yield will be higher on a moral obligation debt bond? Yes. Yes, so in Virginia, I mean, a general GO bond would, you, you would have the lowest yield. The issuer, you know, could sell it for the lowest cost versus if that same day, if a state were to issue a GO debt versus an appropriation back debt, there would be difference in pricing. The higher the credit rating, the more the, you know, credit behind it, um, full faith and credit behind it, the lower the cost to issue that debt. For a very highly rated state like the Virginia, the difference in yield is going to be very tiny. When you get down into weaker states like, like in Illinois with a much lower rating, the differential for moral obligation debt could be quite substantial. The assumption always is that a strong state will never allow any of its types of debt to not pay because to do, to do so would cascade up to its best debt as well in in that it would be perceived by the market as a breach of promise. And that promise, especially at the state level, is considered sacrosanct. And, and it's certainly true with the very best states that the market just doesn't worry that, well, it's only a moral obvious appropriation of a AAA rated state that they might decide not to appropriate. Um, that just doesn't happen. Okay. I'm Andrew. All right, so quickly, um, types of, you know, what are the different variety of purposes um, municipal issuers issue debt for? Transportation, um, utilities, um, healthcare, higher ed buildings, jails, housing, economic development. Majority of the times, municipal bonds are issued for capital purposes, for infrastructure financing. But there are states that issue bonds, um, short-term bonds, you know, probably more notes for operational costs. Um, states have done pension obligation bonds. Now those are long-term bonds, but they are not infrastructure financing. Um, states do cash flow financing, which is very short-term, six months to a year. 
um, but majority of the municipal bonds are for infrastructure financing. And so, by the way, 75% of infrastructure in this country is financed by state and local governments. Mm -hmm. All righty, um, uh, just a minute maybe on state and local government relationships. Now, just as states are dependent on federal government and when recession hits and you know federal budget gets tight and federal uh, feds start cutting their budget and they're uh, passed through grants to state governments, states do the same thing, you know, we try to balance our budget and we start cutting and as a result we cut payments or grants or aid that state government provides to local governments. Um, so local governments in this past um, recession have had a kind of a double family because they have seen reduction in grants that flow through state government from the federal government. Um, things like payment for Medicaid, social services, you know, those kinds of things. But also they have seen reduction in payments that state makes and one of the major uh, line item in most states budget that f goes to local government is funding for K-12. In Virginia it is the largest item, it takes up 25% of our budget is, you know, general fund budget goes towards K-12 financing. Um, so, uh, you know, we can talk a little bit more about this later, but how can states assist local governments in their debt issuance and management? You know, we work with our localities to make sure that they promulgate debt issuance policies. It is very important that they have, they know what their capacity to issue debt is. And also states, um, most, majority of states help local governments provide conduit financing like by forming authorities where they can, you know, uh, take advantage of pooled resources and a higher credit rating of an authority than their individual credit rating to access municipal market. Uh, with that, I will kind of stop. Can I just mention a few more terms about bonds because that might come up later? So when we talk about debt, each of one of those original geo debt or revenue debt could be issued as variable rate debt or fixed rate debt. So you'll e hear these terms often. Um, and debt can be a serial maturity, meaning it's the debt is amortized uh, every year. Highly rated states and highly rated credits do serial amortization where they don't issue a bond for 20 years and then just pay off lump sum. You know, don't borrow half a billion dollars and pay off in 20 years. Um, we amortize each year. So serial versus bullet maturity, that's the difference. And sometimes you hear what are called CABs, capital appreciation bonds where um, you know, because finances are tight, the issuer chooses to make only interest payments for the first several years um, and then starts on principal payments later. So those are just a few things here. No, terrific. Okay, so George, and then both of you will have a chance to kind of come back and, mm -hmm. and so George, you've got, uh, you've got uh, 12 minutes. You have so much knowledge that <laughs> I'm, I'm worried you're not going to be able to do this in 12 minutes. Um, well, I'll, I'll do 20, 12 minutes worth and whatever I don't cover. I don't cover. Can <laughs> um, you put the mouse on the yeah. table? Ah, on the table. That would be a good idea. That's what mouses are for. Yeah. Come on. And then you go to... Um, slideshow. Okay. Slideshow? Slideshow. slideshow. Yes. We'll just get you where you need yeah. to be. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, number of things that aren't on on here before starting. Uh, some some general ideas that I think are really important. Um, one, what defines what can come as a municipal bond is, or as a tax exempt municipal bond. Is, is the tax code. Um, Congress has total control under, under an important um, um, Supreme Court decision uh, versus South Carolina back in the 80s has total control over what can come on a tax exempt basis. Um, there are taxable municipal bonds. They started in large size with Build America bonds, which were issued during 19, uh, 2009 and 2010 as part of the stimulus package. 
the muni market was going through some real difficulties, um, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, and it was thought that to give the, the muni market access to bonds that would be issued taxable, but subsidized 35% by the the interest is, is subsidized 35% by the by, by the federal government. That that has just subsequently been cut back under sequestration, but but still a very large amount is paid by the federal government as a substitute for the tax exemption. So there's that one complexity. Very important watershed in the municipal bond market happened during the financial crisis. Before the financial crisis, muni bonds never defaulted um, with a capital N. I mean, the, the, the number of defaults in a given year were two to three, maybe four, of rated debt. Um, it's still not extremely high. We're still talking about a default um, uh, experience in unis that's about one tenth of what it is in the same rated corporate bonds. The problem is that these are all very high profile. And the other problems are two, twofold. One, that um, before the crisis, half of the municipal bond market was insured fully half. All of those insur insurers were essentially, t were all AAA rated by the, the rating agencies. This made the muni market really easy for the individual investor to navigate because with no defaults and the AAA rating, it was perceived that, well, I just buy some insured bonds, they're AAA, uh, I don't have to know that much about the underlying credit, they don't default anyway. Um, and under that environment, the, the individual investor was pretty much the dominant buyer of, of municipals, either through um, direct buying or through bond funds. And well over half of all outstanding munis still are owned by individual investors, either directly or through bond funds. What has happened more recently is there have been, well, one, for one thing, the, the bond insurance market is about 2 or 3% of the total market right now. There are a few new functioning uh, bond insurers, but they're tiny, um, and the market doesn't rely on them. Two, uh, because the market has become so much, much more complex, makes it a lot harder for the individual investor to navigate. Um, and also, there have been a series of high-profile either defaults or crises. Just mention a couple. Um, obviously, Detroit. Puerto Rico, we'll talk about later. It has not defaulted, but its rating agency, it, its rating has, has dropped to barely investment grade on most of its issuers. Um, there have been a handful in California, like San Bernardino and, and uh, Vallejo, um, and there's and th there's now a suggestion that Scranton may not be able to pay its debt. There's a couple in in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, ironically the state capital. So there's more angst in the air about municipal credit, even though the the the, the number of defaults is is still quite tiny as a percentage of the total amount of, of debt outstanding or issued. Um, Muni yields quite literally had collapsed um, through last year. Um, there wasn't a heck of a lot of muni debt being issued, and I'll talk about that later in a few minutes. But look, look at the, the second line at the bottom. I'm, I hope you can all see it. Um, the yield in the end of November in 2000, of 2012 had reached a low watermark and has been climbing ever since. Um, for example, 0.89% uh, on seven-year munis, now it's 1.92. These are all AAA, by the way. So if you, on, to on, on top of this, you, you add um, 50 basis points, half a percent, 100 basis points, a full percent, as you go down in credit quality. Another complexity of the muni market is that, particularly at the local level, there's an awful lot of small issuers. 
And not only that, as Man Manju indicated, um, the muni market uses a lot of what are called serial bonds. You have a small amount of bonds due each year. You could have a school district with a $10 million issue made up of 20 pieces of $500,000 each. Makes, and there are 10,000 plus issuers in the muni market versus the corporate market, which is under 500. So um, a much more complex market than any of the other markets that um, investors have to deal with. And this complexity has created challenges, particularly as there are more defaults, big name defaults, even though they are still very limited in number. Um, so we've had a really massive swing up in yields. And it's not related to default Detroit. It's not related to Puerto Rico. What we're defining on this table here are all AAA yields. And they're perceived not to be um, of credit risk. Another issue that's particularly on the policy side, um, let me go to the next one. Um, state and local governments, you know, we talk about infrastructure. Infrastructure has like, become like the weather. Everybody talks about it, nobody does anything about it. Um, the green line here is inflation adjusted new issue financing in the muni market. Look what's happened. Back in even two years ago, it was 230 billion or so. It had been growing for a very long time from 80, 90 billion back in the early 90s. Um, it has collapsed. We're now down 100, about, about 130 billion, maybe a little bit more. Um, state and local governments, having become much tighter fiscally and more fiscally conservative, have deferred project after project after project. They are only doing their financings when the bridge falls into the river or the 100 year old water mains blow up. Um, Except for Virginia except for Virginia, <laughs> but uh, at the local level, it is certainly the case, um, and in many states as well, that um, the, what used to be politically uh, a positive, you know, cutting a ribbon, um, is now considered, oh, we're spending on that? <laughs> um, it, ha it hasn't fallen apart yet. Why do we need to spend on it? So that's a very important issue in the, in the muni market for state and local finance in general. Um, who owns municipals? And then I'll, then I'll pass it back. Um, if you, the, the table on the lower left shows basically who owns municipals. It's still very much dominated by the individual investor. Um, you look at the blue column in the middle, 44% um, households and indi other individuals buying directly, 70% uh, mutual funds, then banks, then casualty companies, and so on. Um, but the individual investor is no longer buying to any significant degree. They have let their portfolios roll off. They're much shorter than they used to be. They're getting lots of bonds called. And they, have actual, they actually own about $180 billion less of munis than they did two and a half years ago. So that'll, that'll become an issue when we get into some of the concerns for the market later. So I'll pass the manager back, back now. Okay. So now um, some of the topical policy issues that we're facing. Mm. Uh, so <coughs> All right. So what are the challenges to us as issuers, um, you know, and, and what are the challenges in the muni market? First of all, as you all know, the economy has been in slow recovery. It's been fits and start. You know, you kind of start seeing growth rate and then it comes down again and then it goes back up again. So the economy has been kind of a, you know, very slow growth. There's been drag. Um, and this drag has been caused by things like Congress, I mean, sequestration, debt ceiling debates, you know, we keep kind of coming to the precipice of that cliff before we decide to take any action. Um, the unemployment numbers are still, you know, 
um, much higher than uh, what was anticipated two years ago where we would be at this point in time. Um, housing's been the only bright spot in the economy. Um, so all this has really weighed uh, the revenue, uh, weighed down the revenues for state and local governments. Um, the state and local governments have high unemployment compensation bills. Many states had to borrow from federal government to keep uh, making those uh, extended unemployment compensation benefits, to keep providing those benefits uh, to their citizens. And um, that has really hurt uh, the state's ability to do something else because they now have to pay the federal government back. Medicaid and Affordable Care, Care Act, you've been hearing that in the newspapers, you know, the costs associated with ACA is further going to put a strain on the state budgets. Um, and of course, the government shutdown and sequestration affects some states more than others. Virginia, Maryland, um, and a handful of states um, that have received higher percentage of federal spending. Our economy relies a lot more on federal spending because of our proximity. We benefited all this these years from proximity to federal government. Well, now it's hurting us. <laughs> Um, all right, so there is huge risk um, for states and uh, for municipal bonds with regards to federal fiscal policy. Uh, we keep hearing there are proposals on the Hill. Uh, the president made a proposal to, you know, make changes to tax exemption. There have been proposals from Simpson Bowles that talked about maybe eliminating, taking away tax exemption altogether. Uh, the president in his budget last fall uh, put out the 28% cap. Uh, congression, congressional leaders also have kind of, you know, can come out with uh, some recommendations of their own. And all this has caused volatility in the bond market. Uh, George and I were discussing this yesterday. Um, in November, when the president incorporated the 28% cap in his budget, uh, between November 30th and third week of December, we saw the bond market become so volatile and it rose 50 to 70 basis points given the credit quality. That at the, just the threat that this might happen, that 28% cap may be put in. And a cap is very problematic because it's not just prospective. All these proposals that are out there, they're not just like on these new bonds that you issue will now only get tax exemption up to 28%. And if you are in a bracket higher than 28%, you don't get the tax exemption. It's like all these bonds that are already in the market, all those people who bought those bonds thinking that they were going to be 100% exempt from tax, the interest earnings will now have to start paying interest uh, tax on some of the interest earnings. Um, so, you know, that causes volatility and penalties for issuers. And currently outstanding bonds. Outstanding I bonds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and estimates of higher yields uh, from what we saw uh, from the empirical data back in December, um, you know, showed that it, the yields went up 40 to 75 basis points. So what does this all mean for states? I mean, it means our costs will go up. Now, I know uh, there's, um, you know, faction out there that doesn't believe that the municipal market works as efficiently because when I had meetings with officials in the White House, they said, well, our research shows that Majority of the people who are taking advantage of the tax exemption, the, the interest being exempt from tax, taxation, are wealthy individuals who are in the higher brackets. Um, that may be true, but I pointed out to them that if you take away tax exemption or if you cap tax exemption, what it would do is raise our cost of financing and we have to pass on that cost to citizens and then we will be passing on to all income levels and not just high income levels. So on one hand, where they think that by just taking away tax exemption, they are just only going to affect the rich who don't really care, it won't really hurt them. All of a sudden, the trickle down effect is that state and local governments will have to pass it on more to the middle class. So they really increase the cost for the middle, for the middle class. Uh, if we are to continue to doing the financing, or our other option is to let more bridges fall in the river <laughs> and uh, only do things at the very last minute, which is not good for the country. I mean, we all know there are huge infrastructure needs. Um, so my point to Congress and to the White House has been um, that this is a market that's been working very efficiently, in our opinion, for over 100 years. It's based on principles of federalism where 
you know, the states in 1913, when the Income Tax Act was adopted, agreed that states will not tax interest on treasuries and that the federal government will not tax interest on municipal bonds. So it's not something they should unilaterally just find out you know, focus on the numbers and some number crunchers say, oh, well, this can help us bridge our deficit by X percent or X billions of dollars, so let's take it away. That the unintended consequence, it would be too great and hurt the economy. I'm sorry, can I just ask you to clarify, uh -huh. when you say that if the exemption was um, the 28% uh -huh. and that it would trickle down to all taxpayers, is that because municipalities would have to pay higher yields and so yes. therefore you'd have sorry. to raise? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Because if you as an investor were buying our bonds and you were in the 39% category, your tax rate is 39% or 39.6, which is 40%. So it, now you will only get 28% of that income would be sheltered. The, you'd have to pay tax on the difference between 28 and 40%, which is 12% of your income would be ta subject to tax. So that you will demand higher in, uh, yield from me because you're losing a benefit, so you're like, oh, if I'm going to buy these bonds, I need to have earn some more to compensate me for that loss in that uh, shelter, sheltering that income from tax. So if I, own, if, if I don't own any municipal bonds and I make $30,000 a year and I have a small 800 square foot house, um, my property taxes could go up to finance the higher yield? Yes. Got yes. It. Because if our if costs go up... It goes into the bond market. If hmm? your town go issues bonds. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And which we do, because that's our only way of financing. Um, it's the, the way we finance is through, you know, issuing bonds, um, infrastructure financing, and we know the needs are really great. So the cost will go up, and the way state and local governments pass on the cost is through income tax, which affects all income levels. It's not just to the wealthy. So if the rates go up, they go up for everybody, or sales taxes or property taxes. All these taxes are more regressive on the middle class. I mean, they hit the middle class well, the you know, harder. Virginia has an income tax, and you could raise income tax on the higher, higher income residents. Right, but you know, when we talk about municipal issuers, it's not just states. Uh, how does a local government raise its cost of borrowing? I mean, they'll pass on to property tax rates, right? That's so, about all they have. Right. Yeah, so a, a homeowner who owns an average home of $200,000 it, you know, his or her rate's going to go up, uh, so as the rate for a million dollar homeowner, but everybody's going to have to pay. So there will be, there's nothing like free lunch here. If Congress thinks that, oh, just taking this away will affect the rich and it won't really affect anybody, um, I think they're mistaken. Um, they would really be affecting more middle class families this way. Um, sequestration government shutdown, I won't spend much time on that. You kind of know that it's affected. The only uh, point I would make there is we still don't know what the impact of the shutdown was on state governments. Although Congress has gone back to reimburse federal employees, a state like Virginia, you know, we might get our income tax because there are 600,000 federal workers on Virginia soil. Uh, but we may have permanently lost some of the sales tax because, you know, during shutdown, people stop spending, and just because they get reimbursed later, they don't double their amount of spending of, you know, discretionary um, goods and services. Um, pension. Pension is a huge issue for um, municipal issuers. As you all may have read, um, articles after articles that rating agencies are now paying a lot more attention to unfunded pension liability. So these liabilities are not new, they were always there, and rating agencies kind of took them into account, but in a very informal way. Now they're saying, you know, they each have come out with how they are going to calculate pension, unfunded pension liability, and how they're going to take more, in a much more formal way, take into account while assigning credit ratings to issuers. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, now come to the forefront and it's kind of really shown a spotlight because now the policymakers, the general assemblies, the boards of supervisors are all getting concerned because they are figure finding out that, oh my God, that all these years when they kind of played, um, you know, the game with like, oh, let's assume an 8% uh, discount rate or 8% rate and let's amortize it over 30 years instead of 25 years 
has you know resulted in l underfunding and of course what's hurt is the performance market performance over the last couple of years in 2009 and 10 pension systems are still trying to recover and make up for the huge losses they incurred um, on an average a pension fund lost 24 25 percent was it in 90 2009 and, and 2010 period and let me just uh, you know if you have the, the finance of that is that you have a liability in the future and you think about what is the price of that liability today, the higher your discount rate, the lower you can make that money, that, that amount in today's, and that's the amount that you use to show how much you need to fund today. So they play games. So games are played with this discount rate because you assume a higher discount rate, that means the net present value of that liability is lower today and you have to allocate less resources to it today. And so that's how pensions get underfunded um, not just by our states, right. but also um, And of course, um, uh, George kind of alluded to all the um, local bankruptcies. So, uh, you know, I think the last time I saw a municipal default rate, it was 0.4% over a 40-year period. This is a $3 trillion market, 0.4% over a 40-year uh, average. Um, I don't know what the most recent is. It might be just slight, slightly higher, but it's still very low compared to, like you said, tenth of the corporate market. But these, you know, these are high profile. Detroit's the largest city ever, and so what might happen in Detroit might be precedent setting, and that would determine how investors will look at geo bonds because Detroit had geo bonds and now the you know Detroit officials are saying well, wait a minute you know you bondholders will are be on an equal footing with the retirees and some other credit holder you know debt holders whereas investors may have believed that because they held the geo bond that they were you know a step above and that they would get the first payment that it would be a waterfall effect where the first monies available would go to the geo holders then to retirees so everybody's kind of waiting to see how that issue is resolved um, uh, infrastructure needs I talked about that um, increasing regulatory environment is something maybe we can talk a little more um, as we get into um, George's presentation if that issue comes up okay I know how to get rid of one. No, oh, no, you want me to do it? Sorry. No, I can do it. There we go. <laughs> okay. So take it to the left. Okay. That's my show. All right. There you go. All right. Um, just a little more on the pension issue because going forward, that is going to be probably the highest profile issue both at the state and the local level. Um, there's a number of other important points on the pensions. One, uh, Manju mentioned that it depends how you measure it. Um, what we mean by discount rate, let's, let's drill down a little bit there. What we mean by a discount rate is the assumed amount that the state pension fund or local pension fund will earn in the future and when these pension well, when these discount rates were set was during this huge, lengthy period of very high returns on stocks on much higher yields on bonds than we have today um, and the other thing that was different back then very different is that the amount of time that pensioners lived after they retired was vastly lower. So the agreements that were made on pensions were in a massively different environment than state and local governments are facing today. And there are going to be battles waged, including court challenges, as to just how strong those promises are, where they sit relative to general obligation debt, I'll get back to that in Detroit, um, and um, whether those pen pension promises, once made, can be cut back. And that's a very important issue in Detroit that I'll get to in a, in a couple of minutes. 
Um, what is why are yields higher? What what has happened to the demand side from the from from individual investors? Although a lot of the discussion in that one sees in the press is about the fear about credit, what actually happened starting about the end of May is that as there began to be t discussion of taper of of um, the of quantitative easing by the Fed, as investors started to worry more about long-term rates going higher, both taxable funds, which is the sh the, sh the shaded area, and muni funds, which is the line, collapsed into very sharply negative territory. Muni funds have uh, the value of muni funds outstanding has dropped about almost seventy billion dollars this year. Um, and it's almost all happened since beginning the end of May, at exactly the same th time as the same thing happened on the taxable side. Were there new credit risks crises on the taxable side? No. So I would suggest that most of the concern, and this is certainly true when I talk to individual investors, are fears that r interest rates in the future have to go higher, um, that um, as a result, if, if I buy bonds today, long-term bonds today, or long-term funds today, um, that when rates inevitably go much higher, that the value of my funds or bonds is going to collapse. Lock into a low rate today. Yeah, lock into a low rate today, and sure as shooting, the, the Fed is going to, to I eliminate QE. They're going to eventually, investors believe, raise short-term rates, and this will damage the value of my bonds. Well. I can make a pretty strong case that the amount of the increase in, in yields is not going to be that great, um, and that when the time when the U.S. economy is, uh, achieves what I call escape velocity, where the Fed really has to worry about raising short-term rates, doing more than just eliminating QE, could be five, six, seven years. Meanwhile, individual investors have been huddling at in the shortest maturities have been letting their 5% bonds that they bought years ago be called and not replacing them and the demand that's why the demand for funds and the demand from the individual investor has dropped very appreciably and that's why in that first table I showed you yields have gone up massively over doubled in most of those maturities since last November shows very shows very very uh, um, graphically here, what happened just about May. That's where that collapse occurs. Um, what is, uh, Mandrew focused mostly on Virginia and on the state level. What is happening at the local level is significantly different in terms of credit strength than is what, it, what has happened at the, at the state level. The, uh, by the way, one more point on the pension issues. There are enormous differences in the estimates as to how much the liability is. Um, there's a, a pair of, of people at uh, Northwestern University who have do, done their own work. They assume that pension funds should, 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 uh, should assume no more than the yield on treasuries to come up with their estimate of future liabilities. They estimate that the unfunded liability is around three trillion plus. Others who have estimated this, like the Pew Center, their number is about 800 billion. So the liability is somewhere between 800 billion and three trillion, uh, depending on how, how much you assume state and local governments, this is all state, by the way, um, you assume states will be able to earn in the future. The other pension issue, at, particularly at the state level, is that there are a number of states who are not even making their annually required, con required contribution, which is the amount that you would pay in to pay off your liability over 30 years. Um, so that this pension issue is an extraordinarily important one, both at the state, le state level and at the local level. Just an advertisement, we're going to try to do a session on pensions uh, to really get into the accounting of it and how to think about it really early in the morning because it's working stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing that has happened 
at the, more at the local level than at the state level is a dramatic reordering of the thinking about credit strength. Yeah. Manju talked about that at, at the state level that general obligation debt is the strongest, uh, that revenue bonds are somewhat less strong. Um, well, that may not be true at the local level. Uh, we'll find out a lot more when we get to Detroit. Mm -hmm. So let's get to I Detroit. <laughs> um, well, I don't, let's see where I have that. Well, if I, uh, here it is. Yeah, well, I'll just have it here. Um, the, the, if, assuming Detroit makes it into bankruptcy, which is still being tested, um, they will make it eventually if they don't make it today. The, the issues that are being cont contested by the unions are fairly technical. They could win. That doesn't make Detroit less insolvent, and they will get back into bankruptcy eventually. What they have claimed, and this is the big issue for local governments generally, they have claimed that full faith and credit, unlimited tax geos, that really have a claim on specific parts of the uh, uh, of the tax revenues that come into the city, that those full faith and credit geos are 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 unsecured, and have no more credit strength than lease bonds, and certainly no more credit strength than 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 pension funds. Um, this was a shock to the market that they would even try to claim this. It's not clear how that is going to go in bankruptcy court. One thing we do know. Revenue bonds, including Detroit's own water and sewer revenue bonds, are not part of bankruptcy. When a judge gets the bankruptcy, what, bonds that are backed by, by what are called special revenues are thrown out of the bankruptcy. The bankruptcy judge says, well, these are backed by special, special revenues. Chapter 9 of the bankruptcy code says bonds backed by special revenues are not going to be impaired by the um, by, by Chapter 9. So we'll, we'll just take them out. And that's been going to be true in Detroit as well as, as well as everywhere else. So there's been a reordering in the thinking at the local level as to just what the strongest bonds are. And many investors have been focusing more on water and sewer, um, toll road, um, electric utility, um, all the things that are done by either state or local governments where there is a specific claim on the revenues. At the state level, absolutely. The, the state geos are the strongest credit you can find. At the local level, we don't know if that's true anymore. We'll find out a lot during this Detroit bankruptcy crisis that, that, that we're dealing with right now, depending on how the, the judge rules. Um, the other major crisis that we have in terms of credit quality is Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is extremely widely held by investors. They've got around 70 billion, depending on how you measure it, in bonds outstanding of different types. Geos, Government Development Bank, Highway, Electric, you name it. But in the aggregate, none of them is any stronger than the, than the Commonwealth's economy. And the Commonwealth's economy has been under pressure. The better quality paper of Puerto Rico, other than some sales tax bonds with a special pledge, is running around triple B minus, triple B to triple B minus in credit strength. The risk there is that it go, if it goes below triple B minus, it is no longer investment grade. And Why are they so popular? What were the taxes? The, no, the, the, the popularity, good question. The popularity is because under federal law, bonds backed by uh, Bonds issued by a commonwealth or per, per, a t territory or protectorate, not a state or local government, um, Puerto Rico, um, U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, are tax exempt in all 50 states. So that they were used by bond funds in a state like Maryland, which can't find enough bonds that are tax exempt in Maryland because they don't issue that many. So they would, in their bond fund, add in some Puerto Rico bonds. And many, many specialty state funds, funds that are targeted to a specific state, and 
what we call high yield funds, which are more aggressive, own an awful lot of Puerto Rico paper. What has happened as the outflows occurred that I showed you before in that graph is that every fund has had to sell some of their bonds. The problem is that Puerto Rico, you know, many of these funds own Puerto Rico bonds that they've had to sell into the market. The market doesn't want them very much and requires a very high yield. There's also a realization that Puerto Rico eventually is going to have to come back to the market. They didn't get to $60, $70 billion in, in debt by accident. They do a lot of borrowing. The good news is with the new governor, he's, he's done a lot to tighten the budget there. Um, their revenues are coming in a bit above projections. They still have enormous problems. Um, and they wouldn't be triple B, triple B minus rated if they didn't have enormous problems. So they are a special case in the market that could come back to haunt the entire market if f funds had to dump enormous amounts of them because their rating goes below investment grade and, and they're concerned that investors won't buy their funds anymore and so on. So um, that's, that's uh, a pretty big issue in the market. The other issues in the market, there's two that I want to just focus on for a moment. One, again, on the threat to the tax exemption. Um, the enormous challenge that we have in, as advisors to the muni market like myself or uh, state local officials like Manju is that when we go to talk to Congress or the administration about the importance of the tax exemption, they point to one entity that has, has done a study which claims to show how in, inefficient the tax exemption is, and that's joint tax. They did us the wonderful favor of telling us what, how they, their methodology works um, in a study that came out in July 2012. Uh, their methodology is awful. I, you know, I, I have a 30-page paper that if anybody wants it, they can email me, george.friedlander at city and I'll send you a copy of it. I have also shorter pieces. Their methodology is really, really weak. The problem is for a state official or a local official to go in and fight this battle based on trying to get Congress to, to ignore the joint taxes numbers is almost impossible. Well, we have this set of numbers. We use their, the joint tax numbers in every part of the tax code. Whether you're right or wrong about their analysis, those are the numbers we're going to use. And the fact that they show the muni market to be vastly more inefficient than it actually is, unfortunately, is a battle we have to fight, but it's a battle we may not win. The other issue that, about the, the threat to the tax exemption, to go back and retroactively change the value of the tax exemption, where since 1986 tax reform, we have been told, over and over again by Congress. Yes, we may make changes again in, in the tax code that affect municipal bonds, but those bonds that were bought at a lower yield because they were tax exempt, we will never change that for bonds that are already outstanding. Well, with the administration's proposal, which was po first introduced in 2011, um, there is now a suggestion we may do it retroactively. The House in particular hates this hates the idea of breaking this promise for three, $3, billion, $3 trillion of outstanding municipal bonds. So we have some wiggle room there. The other good news on, on the threat to the tax exemption, good news from the point of view of state and local governments, is the chances of there being a major bill that actually gets into this uh, any time before 2016. We almost lost this battle in 2012 in December. It's unlikely that the battle comes back any time before the presidential election. They can't get their act together on much simpler issues than tax reform or changing the tax code and so on. So um, it probably won't happen for some time, but the ba that battle will never go away because sometime in the future they will change the tax code, and when they do, they're going to use the joint tax numbers that, that are so bad. Okay. Last point, it'll take me 30 seconds, and then I'll pass over, which is... There, the Fed and um, other agencies have come out with a set of rules for banks as far as to what is defined as a liquid asset. 
we had been been told that that's, that this would include uh, high quality municipal bonds. The new proposed rules that came out last week, they gave no credit to municipal bonds. Triple B corporate bonds are considered liquid. Triple A muni bonds are not. It's a crazy result. It's only a proposal. We're going to fight it, but. These are the kind of issues that, it, that happen between the federal government and state and local governments on the policy side because they don't always take into account what would be the implications of the, these changes for the costs of borrowing for state and local governments. And right now, the biggest buyer of municipal bonds is banks. It's not individuals. So if we lose them, it would hurt the muni market a lot, and this is going to be a big battle over the next three or four months. Back to the matter. Mike. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, guys. I, I am just completely flattered to be on this panel with George and Manju, who really uh, know uh, the, uh, the 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 bond, the municipal bond markets, and you know the the nitty gritty of uh, financing inside and out. My perspective is as someone who covers the state and local government. In fact, the unique, very unique government of the District of Columbia, which is a has aspects of a state, city, and county government. And uh, my perspective is to sort of help you figure out how do you understand at a jurisdictional level what, uh, what the municipal finance situation is, what sort of uh, debt is your jurisdiction issuing, well, what is the underlying economic health of your jurisdiction, the financial health of your jurisdiction, um, and what resources are out there to help you figure that out. And uh, for a place like the district, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of eyes on the on the on the fisc. Uh, there's reporters. There's uh, there's a, a city council. There's elected officials. In a lot of places, that's not true. Um, you know, there, there there are fewer reporters. They may not know exactly uh, what the the realities are. And what we saw even in, in places like Detroit, in places like Illinois, where we have a lot of people with their eyes on the uh, uh, on what's going on. It happens in slow motion and the decisions happen day to day uh, in a way that uh, you find yourself like, like in Detroit over a span of uh, 30 to 40 years uh, on the slow glide path towards bankruptcy. And only now, you know, you, if you re re read the Detroit Free Press did an amazing uh, look back at 30 or 40 years of financial decisions that uh, in there, in 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 isolation, may have looked like uh, the right thing to do at the time, but uh, taken as a whole, uh, paint this uh, incredibly uh, uh, incredible picture of how uh, you know th th there was sort of a snowball down the going down the mountain. So, how do you sort of see the snowball go down the mountain before uh, it becomes a snowball and your your jurisdiction is in bankruptcy? Well. Most places are not Detroit uh, or Stockton, California, or Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or places like that. You, you're probably going to cover a place that's very responsible with its borrowing and very responsible with how, how it sells its money. And I have to say, the District of Columbia, there's a lot of problems in politics and government in the District of Columbia, but municipal finance is really not one of them. Uh, it's, it, it, it's been, for the most part, uh, responsible in terms of its uh, uh, its uh, uh, financial situation, helped immensely by the underlying economic fundamentals of the city, which have been very good over the past uh, 10 to 20 years. So what I will sort of show you a little bit are just some of the resources available to sort of figure this out. And I'm start with documents that are issued by the jurisdiction itself. And the first thing I will point to is the CAFR. So I brought a copy of the district's CAFR, which is a comprehensive annual financial report. Every jurisdiction issues one of these every year. It's the equivalent of a, of a, of a corporation's annual report uh, balance sheet. And uh, not all of them are necessarily as comprehensive as the district's. I think the district's does put out a, a particularly good one. But um, it comes out every February. Um, uh, basically six months uh, after the, um, uh, the district's, uh, four to five months actually, after the district's uh, fiscal year ends. Um, it, it, it comes after the books are audited by the, by the, uh, um, the district's independent auditor. 
Um, and generally speaking, they'll sign off in the book, say, you know, you can trust these numbers. Um, and you have, if you look through here, you'll, there's a lot of formatter that, but you'll see that not only is it about numbers, but there's a lot of great background information here too. And uh, if you're, particularly if you're new and covering a, an area or uh, you're, you're sort of parachuting into a jurisdiction to do a story, uh, you know, th this is a great way to sort of learn some of the, the fundamentals and the history financially. Um, there, there's some, basically, I mean, it, it goes into to some, you know, significant detail about what the, the, the district's financial resources are, what its borrowing capacity is, what it, uh, some of this, the, the other things. So, it's also very, what's also very um, helpful, and this is true for, for most CAFRs, is that there, there's information about the economic fundamentals of the city. And the, the thing that, you know, we, we don't forget about when we're covering these issues of municipal finance is that bar, you know, the borrowing and, and things like that at the, at the end of the day are dependent on the economic fundamentals of the city. The employment numbers, uh, tourism, population, things as basic as that at the end of the day are the things that underlie, you know, your bond rating, your borrowing costs, so on and so forth. Uh, right here you see a table of the district's uh, bond ratings. And, you know, as George and Manju explained, you know, a one tick difference in, 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 uh, in, a, in your, your bond rating is 50 to 100 basis points, uh, which, you know, translates into millions of dollars of additional uh, debt service for taxpayers. 100 basis points is 1%. 100 ba yeah, 100 basis points is 1%. Um, Fitch, by the way, just downgraded Chicago by three notches, three ticks. Right. The day um, on on Friday. So those are the those are the kinds of things that we watch very carefully. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, hold that thought because uh, there, there's a great way to sort of turn these sort of these these financial industry uh, pieces of news into sort of things, sort of news you can use as for, for residents of your city. Uh, okay, so there's a particular, you know, if, once you get past this form material, you get into, there's your auditor's report, this is the auditor signing the statement saying you can believe what we, what they are presenting here, uh, financial highlights. Uh, okay, now here we go into the, the balance sheet, the, the, the city's assets. One thing you may want to keep an eye on is fund balance, which basically re refers to the what, what do you, what does your district have in the bank? Uh, you know, what resources does it have to to take care of a year-to-year -year variance in revenues? If you know, if 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 God forbid there is another great recession, what what resources are, are there available? <coughs> and what you want to do is you you want to see the total fund balance and you know, in the district, certain things are reserved for certain purposes. There's an unrestricted balance, and then there's the total balances. Uh, what you want to do is look at that in terms of your yearly general fund revenues. You know, right now the district has, you know, general fund revenues about $5 billion. Uh, I think in the, the most recent fiscal year, it, it's actually significantly closer to $6 billion. But uh, your fund balance is, uh, we're about, let's see, about 30, 40, 40% 40 uh, of your yearly revenues. And what you want to do is look at the, what, what are the trends over time? Are you building your, your reserves? Or are, you, are you spending down your reserves? In the years during the, you know, in 2009, 2010, the district, like a lot of places, spent down its reserves. And, uh, um, it had reserves to spend down in a way in ways that a lot of places did not and and you know that's the basis for a story is, is you know are you are you socking away money for the good times to take care of the bad times uh moving on down uh right here here you have uh, uh a table of 
budget revenues and expenditures. I mean, there's just a, a tremendous wealth of. Oh, here we go. Here are the basic financial statements. This is what I was looking for. Looking for here. here are your assets and liabilities. Th this may not really explain a lot to you. Th this this has all the fund balances. Uh, uh, and there should be a table in here that shows trends over time. Is there one clearinghouse where these documents are available for public issuers? Uh, or do you have to go to the local agency? You typically have to go to the local agencies if you, you typically there, if you there Google. There is for most. There is for most. Yeah, it's I know there's Emma. The, Emma. Right. Yeah, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board has created a repository exactly. called Emma um, where the vast majority of state and local governments have all of their financial statements and they also add in uh, when there's a material change in financial viability that will typically get, typically go up on Emma right. as well so if you check on Emma check uh, go to the name of a, an issuer uh, you'll see a wealth of information on 90% plus of all issuers okay this is Emma right here um, I'll get to one thing in a in a moment. Oh, <laughs> didn't mean to do that. Mm -hmm. Hope it comes back up. Oh well. Um, okay. One thing that you'll see here in uh, the district scaffer is debt figures. Uh, so the, this shows uh, it's it. it its total amount of issued debt, debt per capita, uh, various figures here. Um, okay, now this is the this is the. Let's see, can I rotate this clockwise? Yes. Here we go. Outstanding debt by type. So this is this is a very interesting table. This will sh sh sort of shows you the districts. Uh, outstanding debt in one table and uh, uh, shows you the sort of some of the trends in uh, indebtedness um, right here you see total debt ratios lower is better because your denominator is the right your revenue source um, here's the total debt uh, we're looking at debt per capita uh, and, and that has gone up uh, from uh, seven thousand dollars in fiscal tw uh, fiscal O three to twelve more than twelve thousand dollars in fiscal twelve. Now you can sort of see uh, with respect to each particular uh, issuance some of the trends here. You'll notice here ballpark bonds. Well, in two thousand five, we decided we're going to build a ballpark, so we issued bonds to build the stadium, and that bumped up your total debt per capita from 9,600 uh, 9, per capita to more than $10,000. Housing Production Trust Fund, the city decided it was going to make a big investment in affordable housing. Garvey bonds are, are, uh, are uh, grand anticipation bonds used for big infrastructure projects. This is related to the, we decided we're going to build a new bridge across the Anacostia River, and, th and that happened there. Now, one interesting thing that happened in the city, and this is this is not necessarily unique, but is unique in the district, is that you'll notice that the district's general obligation issuances were going up pretty steadily from 2003 to 2008. But in 2009, they dropped precipitously and continued dropping. You'll notice they started uh, issuing these income tax secured bonds. And the district for the first, that's because the, for the district for the first time was able to get a triple A rating on one of its de debt issuances since home rule uh, in 1973. And that was on an income tax secured bond that were ha more highly rated than its general obligation bonds. And so they shifted those issuances from the GO bonds into income tax secured. And now they're, we're starting to see them shift back because of the market conditions. And, and they're, they're getting lower costs on the on the um, GO bonds than on the income tax secured bonds. Uh, could, could I make um, an sure. observation here? Yes. So this table, um, if you look at the, the second to the right column, total debt per capita, yep. 
And if you just look at that column, you might say, wow, the district's debt per capita has almost doubled from 7,000 in 2003 to 10 years later, it's gone to 12.5, 12,000 per capita. And that's an alarming increase, right? But you can't just take one number by itself. But if you look at that other column to the left that says uh, just left to the debt per capita, it says debt as a percentage of personal income. It tells you the wealth in the district's going up too because the um, debt as a percent of personal income has only gone from 15% to 17%. So it's not as high an increase. So at the same time, debt per capita has gone up, the wealth, the personal income levels in district have gone up. And as a result, the economy, the economic fundamentals of districts are, remain quite the same that they are able to tax and get more in revenue to pay that higher debt. Yeah. So and just so how you kind of have to look at many things together and not draw a conclusion by yeah. just looking at one column. Is there any central uh, source of comparative data on debt per capita and debt per personal income? Uh, you're comparing uh, yeah. state or city to well, Moody's puts out a comparative matrix, uh, debt per capita for all states. Do they do it for local governments too? For they the do it for some local governments. Yeah, the rating agencies, if you want acc accumulated and not incredibly detailed information, right. the, the best place to go to is a rating agency. And, and, and Moody's, Moody's of the all the most rating of agencies puts out a lot more of these uh, data points debt per capita, debt as a percent of personal income. Um, there's one other thing. They do like three or four of these major uh, indices every year in comparative. So you could kind of look at trend for each state and you can compare similarly rated states with others. One other resource is uh, Pew. Pew Center on the States does state-by-state state state comparisons of fiscal issues and they have city they have a city aspect too, and they, I believe the National League of Cities also. And at the, out at the state level, level Rockefeller Institute does a tremendous amount. Of mm -hmm. So, last thing I will mention on this is, uh, as uh, Manju said, you know, the, the the total level of per capita indebtedness is not uh, necessarily the only thing to look at. Uh, also, as a percentage of your total, what is your debt service as a percentage of total spending in the district? We actually there are restrictions on how much the city can borrow. But the, the, as the city has borrowed more, as we saw on this table, its, uh, its general fund revenues have gone up pretty steadily, and it's kept that ratio. The ratio, as you see, um, has, has uh, stayed fairly steady. And there is now, the, the district has imposed on itself a 12% uh, spending cap, meaning they can't spend any more than 12% of their general fund revenues on debt service. And uh, right now they're uh, inching up pretty close to that, and they, but they haven't breached it yet. Okay, that sounds like a, a good note to end on. So we want just because we want to have our we had a, I saw a couple of other hands, and I want to just make sure everybody has at least a chance to, to raise a question. And let me also mention, um, Mike's got a couple more websites that he did not have time to get to. But if it's okay with you, we will email those sites, those links to you, so you can explore them at your at your leisure. Can I ask about pensions? Um, this is going to sound really stupid, so I apologize, but I don't, I don't really understand. Um, when you're looking at the discount rate and how much you should be contributing each year, why is it not like the weather, right? When we want to know the average temperature for today, they average the last 30 years. Why are they averaging 30 years into the future as opposed to saying, what was our average rate of return for the last 30 years? That's how much rate of return we should be. Well, that's what that uh, the bad news is. That's what they are doing. Um, the problem is that by any measure you want to use, projected returns into the future are likely to be lower. Um, interest rates are lower. GDP growth is lower. Um, the stock market valuations have already gone very high. To assume they're going to continue at that at that level is unlikely. Um, so, yes, that's what they do. They, they have earned 8% over the last 30 years. There isn't any kind of economist I talk to who believes that that's doable going into the future. But the fundamental problem, and you and I can talk on the phone about this and go into far more detail, the fundamental problem is that when you have a, a liability stream, the appropriate as a finance person, an economist told the appropriate discount rate to use is the rate at which you can borrow money, your own borrowing rate. 
because the assumption is the way that you, the the black box in which you think about it is you've got to borrow to pay that liability, and what. George is saying that they do is they actually use the discount rate of projected returns, which is the wrong way to do it. So there's two kind of fundamental problems going on. One is how do you think about that rate of projected returns? And the other more fundamental is should you be using that rate at all? And if you think about the borrowing rate, the borrowing rate is actually quite low. If your discount rate is low, that makes your liability number seem quite high. Your pre the present value of your liability number seem high, be high. And that requires more funding today. So to it's fund a shell game. It's um, has the characteristics of a shell game. Of a, yeah. There are also philosophical questions yeah. here. That mm -hmm. you asked a valid question. Historically, those were the returns. The returns over the last five or six years are closer to zero because of the the sharp drop and yields that you know pension funds own bonds. What are good quality bonds yielding today? Well, four percent to five percent. So that part of their portfolio can't earn more than four to five percent, but they are assuming eight percent for the seven and three quarters, eight and a quarter for the total in most pension funds. So it's 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 a it's a pretty high number relative to what most economists would be comfortable with. At the same time, you just have normally lower now because we're still recovering from And that should be reflected in your projected future earnings, and it's often not. Right? And this is not just states and locals, this is also corporates are doing this. And, and all except the stock market right now. <laughs> I can, I won't do it here, but I can make a pretty good case that, that yields are not going back to historical levels. Inflation is going to stay low. GDP growth is going to be lower than we had uh, up until... Uh, but you can also say they're going to be higher than they are now. <gasps> this is such a good That's advertisement true. for our monetary <laughs> policy <laughs> session, which is coming up. So you won't want to, you definitely won't want to miss that. Yeah, let's just collect, collect that. Uh, I have a question from George. Can you explain why the individual investor, investors are leaving the municipal market? Is there, is it, are they more cautious? Um, what's happened, very, very quickly, it's a complex topic. What's happened on the individual investor side, where they have $200 billion less or so in bonds than they had three years ago, really isn't that they're selling bonds. It's that all of their old higher coupon bonds are reaching their first call date. And an investor who has a 5% bond in the 3% environment is not going to give up that 5% bond until it gets called away. Well, now they're getting called away. Meanwhile, individual investors are terrified about rates going higher, and they're sitting in cash. The, the household sector has $10.5 trillion earning 0% in CDs, money market funds, money market accounts. That, that money needs to get invested again, but investors are so worried about higher interest rates that they've been very slow to put it back to work. And when a bond is called, that means that the issuer exercises the right to pay you now, to retire that debt and to pay you now. And so if that happens to you, you're paid, you've got this cash, do you want to put it back into this investment? at such a low rate when you think that rates might be higher in the future? No, you, you don't want to do that. Almost all muni bonds have a 10-year call. Uh, corporate bonds, most of them, you really can't call just because rates have come down. Muni bonds, almost all of them are 10-year call, and a lot of those higher coupon bonds have been reaching their first call date over the last couple of years. I cover uh, finances of Chicago and Illinois, so it's the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> stories. But it's all it's always difficult to put it in context. And, and is there any source of data on like um, how many cities have uh, such and such credit rating or something like well, that? Well, the, the rating agencies will, will will give you a reporter. They they tend to be very flexible about giving out information. Us on the banking side, we have to pay for it. But that, you go to any any of the three rating agencies, they will give you pretty good data on this. Right, but I guess what I'm looking for is, is a more readily available source on deadline. You know, it's not always possible to get it instantaneously from the rating agencies. I, I again would suggest checking with uh, National League of Cities and or Pew, because mm -hmm. they do put out a lot of uh, uh, studies of you know uh, of local you know state and local financial issues. Um, but There's no market data like that. The, the two best the two best up to date sources. If you can get access to them, the Bond Buyer is our daily paper, and they also have a, a really great 
look back, you know, for the last year, and Bloomberg has become extremely aggressive in covering state and local government finance, and even their free site, not their screens, but even their free site, which you can get right on the internet, has an, an, an awful lot of very, very fresh information. Reuters also has some. I would say those are your, your, your best place to go for as up-to-date as possible would be those three sources. And if you're really on a deadline, then call us at the Center for Financial Markets. <laughs> yeah. So let, why don't we collect all the questions and then we and we can, uh, can we stay late past? Uh, we're happy to, you, from your point of view? Okay. Just going around the room. In the discussion about the eliminating the tax exemption for the uni bonds, you mentioned that the White House has said that uh, the tax exemption primarily benefits higher income earners. What number they say? What percentage of uh, that benefit is going to higher income earners? I don't mm, remember that off the top of my head. If I, I could kind of look into it and send it to you. Do you, yeah. George? The, and by the, the way, the, I passed um, on an yeah. article. This the, was the, written the administration in uses the joint tax study for almost everything they do. The joint, if you go to the joint tax website, and it's not that hard to find there. The study they did on the cost of the tax exemption is in there, and all of their assumptions are in there. And that there's, it's one report that they did, I believe it was July 2012, uh, which gives their methodology, but also gives the assumptions they use. Is there an alternative uh, study you'd recommend instead of the joint tax one? Yeah, all the stuff I did. <laughs> <laughs> I've become the industry point person for, for uh, fighting the threat to the tax exemption, so I can get you a lot of material. George.Friedlander at City. Send me an email, and I can send you some of the old reports. So you're looking for the percent. You know, his, his email, uh, his contact information is on the bio. So your your question is the percentage of outstanding that is purchased by high income, or if, there, if, if the White House, if the administration is saying that uh, this is primarily benefiting high income earners, well, what's what's the, All right. the just to quickly because we have seven questions. Sure, so, sorry. yeah, it, it'll take one sentence. Part of the problem is they use a really really lousy index of how much muni muni bonds yield. It's way too high. So when you compare that index to corporate bonds. It gives you a very, very low number as to how efficient the muni market is, because they're using a bad they're using bad data. But the argument, I, you know, basically is that the higher your income tax bracket, the more this tax advantage helps you versus mm -hmm. people in the lower tax bracket. That's kind of the scaffolding of the argument. Okay. The, the rating agencies and the rating the various municipalities and states. Uh, how sophisticated are they when they? The ratings. I mean, they don't look just at the total amount of borrowing. They look at what this, the money the borrowing is used for. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you look at, you know, we could probably send you a, a Moody's, a typical Moody's report. They do the most published material. They look at dozens of variables in coming up, including political issues, which, by the way, on the Illinois, for example, on the pension fund side, it's a political issue as much as it is an economic one. But, but they go into policy and, and political and economic and financial, and that's all included by the rating agencies. And, and they've become much more aggressive in using all of that data as more ish problems have come up. Manjie, this is a very so basic question. Just a quick question. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. Let, let Manjie, seven questions. And Manjie, did you have? Um, yeah. Just quickly. So rating agencies are very sophisticated in what they look and analyze. So for example, when they look at political climate, they look at management quality. You know, does the governor have the authority to bridge gap if revenues go down, or does he have to wait for General Assembly to come into session? Um, they look at economic fundamentals. They look at your debt burden. Uh, they look at your GDP growth, your you know income growth, e everything. And what you're borrowing for? Yes, you yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh it's yeah, that there. is huge. Yeah. So, um, unlike the the other sides of the of the market where the, where the rating agencies got pretty m messed up. Um, going into the financial crisis. The muni section of the rating agencies is a separate community. They've always done a better job than a lot of their counterparts on the corporate side. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you just clarify, I guess, what you were talking about earlier about some proposal where they're going to treat uh, corporate bonds as liquid and muni bonds as not? Yeah, one sentence. They're, they're, the week before last, the, the four major regulators that, that regulate banks from the, the Fed to the FDIC and so on 
um, put out the, what they call high quality liquid assets. If you look up high quality liquid assets and Federal Reserve, put those two, two phrases into, in, into um, Google, you will get lots of recent material on what's going on there. And with, after the wake of the financial crisis in Basel III, now there are liquidity requirements for banks. So banks have to hold a certain percentage of their assets in liquid assets. So whatever can count as a liquid asset is quite good because banks want to buy them because they, want to, they can meet then their liquidity obligations. And so for municipal debt not to be counted as a liquid asset means that banks don't buy them to fulfill this requirement and it's, uh, you know, has downloads. It's a serious issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, just going around, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, given how Washington policy doesn't seem to care about state and local governments, they just see them as spending they can cut, and that the locals are under-reporting their pension obligations, and they may only recently have come into the purview of the rating agencies, are you worried that there's like a municipal debt collapse coming, like there was a housing debt collapse that they just didn't foresee? There is going to be a massive legal battle about the pension obligations that is going to probably take decades. Every state is going to handle this differently. Every local government is going to handle this differently. The rating agencies have started incorporating this issue much more aggressively into their ratings and they even though it's a big issue they do not believe that for the typical local government or state government but especially local government where it's more of an issue that it is dispositive in terms of creating a crisis there are going to be a handful of crises that come up as a result of this and there are going to be a lot of court challenges so, but this is going to play out over many years to decades. It's not an imminent crisis. And These are long-term problems. limitation laws that limit how much the local agency can raise its taxes, like Proposition 13, you mentioned the free bankruptcy in California. Yeah. Did those contribute to, to the risk? Um, they were a part of the issue in, in California. Um, they all, in California, they don't, also don't get any help from the state when there's a crisis. And um, Yes, there, the limitations on, on taxes, there have been you know, dozens, not just Prop 13, but that's an issue that's unique to California. No other state has that many taxpayer, voter created limitations on what s local governments can do. And it's still a very small number of cities. It's not, you know. Going into bankruptcy is very painful. Vallejo did it. They're the first one that did it. And it was, it was awful for, for their taxpayers. It was awful for their, for their police and fire. Nobody came out a winner in this. And that's the good news because it sent a message that going into bankruptcy as a way of getting rid of your problems really doesn't work very well. So it created a threat that every component of these crises has to take seriously. Well, we want to reach an agreement because if we don't reach an agreement, we're going to go in, in, have to go into bankruptcy, and that's a worse result for everybody. Right. Once a local government or any government goes into bankruptcy for the next four to five years, they have no access to municipal markets, to financing market. That's what happened to New York City and to Cleveland. In 75. Yeah. Um, you know, for four or five years, they could not borrow anything because there were no investors to buy their debt. So that's a pretty hefty price to pay for. And, and you know, also there's there's hangover, right? Orange yeah. County, which right. is now AAA, mm -hmm. still borrows at a higher yield just because mm -hmm. the market remembers Orange County and the bankruptcy. Of right, and ago. because Detroit, lo local governments in Michigan, and perhaps state too, you know, for several years are going to pay a higher yield to bondholders just because of that shock. It's like, oh gosh, this is Michigan paper or this is Michigan local government paper. You know, we need a little more yield here. Any other questions? All right, well, I really want to thank all of our speakers. Manju, we have a oh, national thank you. <laughs> for everybody. Thank you. Mike, thank you.
We want these displayed on desks in the financial sector around the city. And Stacy, thank you. Get so quite a collection. You <laughs> only get one. You only get one. Stacy will be coming I, back. I came to Washington and I got mugged. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just remind everybody that we have two more sessions coming what up. What is this? New York. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you are already registered for the next two sessions, but I'll just remind you: Thursday, December fifth. Oh, sorry, sorry. Tuesday, December tenth. No, that's not it either. <laughs> December. December 14th. Julian? It's the 17th. 17th, thank you. It's December on the website. December 17th, <laughs> we're going to be talking about housing finance. And then in January 14th, uh, we'll be talking about Federal Reserve. So if you had questions early on when there was a discussion of quantitative easing and all of that, come in January. We'll sort it out. One more thing, you'll all get an evaluation in your email. And we ask you to just plead. It will only take you a few minutes. It's just oh, a couple wonderful. of questions. But that evaluation will really help us as we hone sessions into the future. So if you can fill it out and just submit it, it's all online, very simple. Uh, any final questions before we go? Can we get your contact information? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And so thank you, everybody. Else, everybody. Thank you, Stacy, George, Mike, Manju. This was terrific. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.